and the founder of the Center for Journalism and Democracy. The center focuses on training and supporting aspiring journalists in investigative skills and historical and analytic expertise to cover crises based on our democracy. Lisa Cronin Robinson is a professor at the Howard University School of Law, where she teaches constitutional law, gender equity law, international human rights law, and Supreme Court jurisprudence. Cronin Robinson also is a board member for the Center for Constitutional Rights and the U.S. Human Rights Network. Our event moderator, Sydney Clark, is a Howard University student, a writer, spoken word artist, who has dedicated her time to social advocacy and is affiliated with Hunt Textbook, a history podcast for the future. Thank you, Sydney, for your moderation today.
reading people like Frank, Francis Watkins Harper, right? It's just, it, it really isn't possible. Um, I like to both read what scholars have unearthed and how uh, they are interpreting history, and then I like to read original documents myself. So uh, I was reading the letters that George Washington was writing back and forth to other people when he says, you know, we don't, they want to make us, the British want to make us their slaves, we have made black people. So going and reading those original documents are really important because what, what you learn, of course, is um, when historians or scholars are quoting from a document, they're quoting the part of the document that they find relevant to the argument that they're going to make, but that's not the whole document. And I'll just give a quick example, then I'll, I'll move on. But you think about the Declaration of Independence, for instance. Um, the opening stanza of that declaration, most of us can say without looking at the page, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and died by the Creator with the inalienable rights. Um, I would guess that's all that most of us have read of that document, right? Yes, have any of you ever read the entire Declaration of Independence? So if you just read that, you think the Declaration of Independence is a liberty document. But it's actually not. It's a document of succession. It's the colonists, the white colonists, laying out the crimes that they believe the British have committed against them and saying, these are all the things they've done. This is why we want to succeed from uh, Britain and form our own country. So that's just an example. And part of what they talk about is the savage Indians, um, whose land they want. And part of what they talk about are the insurrections, which are enslaved people who they say that the crown is stoking insurrection, so they're stoking our, our enslaved to rise up against them, which gives you a very different perspective on the Declaration of Independence if you read it in, in its entirety. But if you're only reading that one piece that someone has pulled out, then you can't really understand uh, what the true history is and what the documents are. So uh, I just read it all the time. <laughs> Reading is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> now to the good stuff. Democracy. Now, in both of your opinions, how has democracy evolved from 1776 to the present, both in theory and in practice? That's a whole lecture in itself. <laughs> Since I just spoke about that, you. Take it first, and then I'll add on. Thank you for your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's not the same. I mean, so I think to be totally fair, it's not the same um, as it was, let's say, 1776, for the there. But it's not what it says. It's trying to be. Um, I spend a lot of time in interdisciplinary research, but because I'm trained as a lawyer, I spend a lot of time in cases, particularly cases that aren't often taught in law schools other than, I would say, other than how. Um, so to, to sort of look at what aspirations are laid out, let's say, in the Constitution with respect to democracy, even. But to recognize that even within the document, there are clear conflicts, right? And in those points of conflict come, I think, to the fore the overriding interests that the framers have. So on the one hand, you know, representative democracy, et cetera, et cetera, but on the other hand, there's no direct election of the president, right? The, the electoral college. Um, so it's not what it was. It's not what it claims to be or purports to be, um, which is why we continue to see often because of activism and uh, assertions of our own personhood by folks of African descent, that is the uh, catalyst, right? So that it, it corrects itself, it perfects itself 
oftentimes in reaction to uprisings from people who, by virtue of their very existence and the lives they live, are proof positive of the fact that there's a gap between what's said about democracy and how it actually plays out. All right, so one, I think, if we are to contemplate that question, we have to define our terms. What is meant by democracy? So um, if democracy is as uh, those who govern, govern with the consent of the governed, then we didn't obviously have a democracy at our bottom. And what I would argue, what I do argue, based on what historians have argued, is that we were founded as a slaveholding republic, which we were. Um, so the, the primary drafters of our founding documents were all the slavers from Virginia. And they drafted documents that uh, believed uh, in a republic for landed white elite men. And their very concept of republicanism comes from the fact that most of the poor who would be able to challenge their power were enslaved and so could not act politically and could not challenge their power. So we were not intended to be founded, I think, as a true democracy. Um, women couldn't vote. Enslaved people, which were one fifth of the population at the uh, American Revolution, certainly couldn't vote. Um, and many poor white people who didn't own land could also not vote. So what are we calling democracy? And this is when we tell ourselves that we are the oldest continuing democracy in the world. Um, these two political scientists who wrote a book called How Democracy Die gave me a term that I had never knew, but that, that, is, that is the right term, I think, which is they said, until 1965, we were an ethnocracy, which is a democracy for one ethnic group, which is a democracy for white people. Um, and it's not until 1965 that the passage of the Voting Rights Act, which only seeks to enforce the constitutional rights of black people had earned 100 years earlier with the 15th Amendment, that we get a semblance of true democracy because everyone uh, ostensibly has the right to now cast a ballot. So I think we have to think about how we're defining things and that part of the myth making about America is that we've had democracy that since our founding, that we were founded as a democracy. But that's only if we're only counting certain people as citizens, uh, which, of course, as a descendant of those who were not citizens, I, I would not count democracy in that way. Um, so then what I argue then is that uh, as much democracy as we have, it's been born on black resistance, that black people had an expansive view of democracy, a real view of democracy, that democracy includes everyone, and that we all have a right um, to have a say in how we are governed and who we select to represent us. But that has been because of a century long battle of black people against their own country men, mostly, um, to achieve that democracy. So democracy in this country is really 60 years old. <laughs> I mean, beyond. <laughs> Sorry. Um, beyond what's already been said. I mean, that is really a true democracy. But there's a disconnect between what exists and has existed in this country and what a true democracy is. I think November 8th is an example of the challenges to what true democracy would look like. The extent to which we've got extensive uh, voter suppression, disenfranchisement, that the reaction to um, the sense that things are opening up is to further restrict the ability of people to not just live, but to cast them out, um, often making or trying to make it a crime to even 
help people be able to cast their ballots. So at this point in time, 2022, in many respects, the threat to what has been possible with, you know, a mixed bag with respect to the enforcement of even the Voter Rights Act. Um, 2022, I think, demonstrates that democracy is in peril and is being experienced by large segments of this country as being anti-American. It's a threat to their own view and beliefs about what this country is about. And the backlash tends to come when truth is spoken. So similar to sort of the backlash that you receive once you the initial piece and then the larger book, um, critical race theory. Um, because in many respects, having been trained in critical race theory because it is something that came out of legal education, legal scholarship, to recognize almost the 1619 project as being in that spirit and seeing both, in fact, attacked under the banner of it being anti-democratic, anti-American, a threat to democracy is uh, <coughs> alarming, um, but not surprising. Uh, I will leave it at that and pass it off to oh. I mean, all I would add to that is, again, I, I feel like it's so difficult for us to really grasp what's, ha what's happening in our country because we've just been taught a history of a country that never existed. And so, um, so when we see what's happening, we don't know how to uh, take it in, how to contextualize it. But if we understand that we were a country where black people were never to be citizens, we were brought here to be laborers, and once uh, it became clear that emancipation was to happen, there was a movement to ship us out of the United States, including by the great emancipator, uh, Abraham Lincoln, in his original draft of the Emancipation Proclamation, he put a, a call in there to colonize black people outside the United States at freedom. So we were not ever to be people who could partake in democracy. We were not to be citizens. And we were founded to be a country led by white men. And so this idea of democracy has always been exclusionary in the United States. So when we look at what happens after a multiracial coalition of voters with a minority of the white vote, which is important, elect a first black president, it becomes clear that something has shifted in our democracy. That you don't, a white majority never hold, now no longer holds exclusively the reins of power in determining uh, who will lead our country in the highest offices. And that's when you see this backlash against democracy itself. And we've seen it before. We've seen it in the period of Reconstruction, right, where we go from being an exclusively white-led country to now black people engaging in the democratic process after the Civil War, and then we see this backlash, and we lose. We have democracy or assemblies of it for about twelve years, and then it is violently suppressed. Um, we see the same things, right, uh, casting down on elections, the effort to overturn democratic elections and the overturning of democratic elections. And to be clear, all of the laws that uh, stopped black people from voting before 1965 are all race neutral laws, right? Because it is illegal, it's unconstitutional to explicitly deny black people the vote when you pass a grandfather clause, which doesn't mention race, it just targets people by race. Literacy tests, poll taxes, they don't mention race but they are racially targeted, much like the voter ID laws of today, right? They don't mention race, they are racially targeted. So that is what we're seeing, is a certain segment of our society who realizes that a white majority does not wield the power that it once did to determine our elections and therefore to determine everything, right? We vote because that determines law, that determines regulations, that determines power. Um, and then they say, well, we're not a democracy. We're a republic, right? Where they say we don't really believe in democracy anymore. We believe in authoritarianism. We believe that we should have the right to determine it um, because they were never to be governed by people of color. And um, that is where we are right now. If you don't understand that history, 
So you can't understand what's happening in our country right now. You certainly can't fight it because you are you're trying to fight something that you have no idea why it's functioning. You fight it. So that's what I think is so critical. And you're absolutely right, Professor, that the reason you see at the same time uh, these rising voter suppression laws, this efforts to overturn elections, uh, an insurrection on the Capitol is coinciding with this anti critical race theory propaganda campaign because if you are learning a more accurate history of our country, then you understand exactly what's happening. But if you are not, right, if we are learning a very proscribed, manipulated history, which most of us learn, that will say, oh, our, our institutions will hold, we're the greatest democracy in the world. So yeah, Donald Trump is a little crazy, but overall, everything will work out. There's nothing about our history that should make us believe that. But if you don't learn that history, then you can't understand what it is that you're confronting. And so these efforts are really about social control, right? You control the population by controlling what we know about our history, what we can understand about what's happening in our country. I just wanted to jump in, uh, because the point you said about if we don't know our history, right, then we're subject to control. Um, even, let's say, the term of the founding fathers, yes. right? Um, and the narrative around black people in the United States that we were the past recipients of all sorts of, like, first it was the oppression, then it was the emancipation because someone else passed it. Yes. Um, but the, the complete history is many of the ideas that I believe we would hold up as the sort of things that we would want to keep, right? If we were asked, okay, what would you keep what would you toss, right? The stuff we would keep, many of those ideas, particularly once you get to the Reconstruction Amendments, 13, 14, and 15, and the civil rights laws that come about during Reconstruction, those ideas are rooted in, among um, other things, the Black Convention gets in, yes. right? Yes. Which, 1830s, Black people are meeting and talking about what citizenship was like, right? What, what, how we deal with the gap between what's written and what's experienced. So once we get to reconstruction, you've got this foundation or base, but it's a foundation that we, in fact, created. It's not a foundation that was put upon us. So in, in some ways, I like to think about founding, right? You've got the original constitution, that comes with its own debate and, and conversation and influences. You've got the Bill of Rights. That comes with its own debates and its own um, 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 origin story, right? We don't pay a whole, well, those of you all who don't go to school here, right, don't pay a whole lot of attention to 13, 14, and 15, that's another cluster with a whole other set of narratives that should help us to determine what, what the original intent was. And the people who are responsible for that original intent often aren't recognized or captured in the mainstream history. Hence, we're, it's this idea of being a juridical subject, right? We're acted upon yes. rather than being actors. Yes. And part of this conversation is about lifting that up so that everyone is on, at least all of us, are on the same page, right? And that we don't, um, we don't, we don't buy into the narrative that we're a passive group of people with no history in this country, if we're looking for a, a history to lift up and find a pride in, you make this point in, in your chapter, we're directed across the Atlantic. But that erases all that's been contributed and all of the good things that we brought to the table, which are, you know, the values 
that many people lift up but falsely attribute to a group of folks who really didn't believe in those values in a universal sense. I mean, you're not going to have much to moderate. But you know, okay. <laughs> um, I, I just think that that point is so important because what the 1619 Project is doing and relying on decades of scholarship, much of it by black scholars, is it is looking at the sciences and saying there's a whole lot in there, right? We have this lens of history, but if you turn that lens, and see what is everything happening off to the side that mainstream white people uh, feel has not thought was important, you actually will better understand our country. And so when we look at the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment, the Reconstruction Amendments, which are, that period is considered the second founding, because that is when we begin to realize, make manifest the ideals of the founding, right? We hope this truth to be self evident that all men are created equal, except all these black men and women and Indians and everybody else who's not equal. But then with these reconstruction amendments, we say, actually, we need that, right? Um, but because black people are not in the Congress, because black people have been enslaved and not allowed to be in Congress, we can't see just by looking at the congressional record and whose names are on those amendments, that is, the language of those amendments are coming directly from black people. They are coming, as you said, from the colored uh, people's conventions that are happening all across the North. There's a great book on it that just came out uh, last year. Uh, they are coming out of uh, black orators like Frederick Douglass. They are coming out of Martin Delaney. They are coming out of black people who are putting these arguments for universal equality, right? Equal protection under the law comes from black people who argue that it goes into the 14th Amendment. Birthright citizenship, so every person in this country when you come here from another land and you have a child and your child is automatically granted American citizenship, that comes from enslaved people who said, we are we deserve to be citizens of the country of our birth. Enslaved people didn't have citizenship in the United States. And citizenship in the United States was not defined until black people pushed for birthright citizenship that every person who immigrates here now benefits from. The 14th Amendment is the most used of the uh, amendments in uh, constitutional law because it is equal protection. So every marginalized group in this country, whether they are the disabled, whether they are gay Americans who use the 14th Amendment when they go before the Supreme Court and argue that equal protection means they should have the right to marry, whether it's women, they are all using equal protection, the ideals of black people that get codified in the 14th Amendment. And yet we get credit for none of it, right? It's like we have no intellectual thought or contribution because you have to look further than a congressional record in a country where 95% of the black population were enslaved. But we were enslaved, but it didn't mean we weren't thinking, right? It didn't mean that the free black population was not agitating, was not reading, was not writing these ideas. And so this is what this speaks to those silences that are shaping our society. Uh, and then we all grow up with this belief, which I talk about in the preface for the book, that certainly black people must not have really contributed that much. Because if we had done these things, if we had contributed to our society, wouldn't someone have taught us these things? But that's not true, right? The absence doesn't mean that it did not happen. And that's why this work is so important, is it brings about those silences of history that are shaping so much of the country that we live in. And yet, white men get the credit for all of it. Now, you have to give credit where credit is due. So, we had a lot of racist white men, but we also had men like Daddy Stevens. We had white men like Charles Sumner, who were actually anti racist. But how many high school kids learn about them? Right? So, you have folks who are like, well, George Washington was a man of his times. Yes, he was. And men of their time who slavery was wrong, including George Washington, <laughs> including Thomas Jefferson. Right? They all know that slavery is wrong, but you also have anti-racist white men who knew that slavery was wrong and who also believed in black equality, but you don't learn about them either. So that's the point is all of what we've been taught. It is a manipulation. And this is the last thing I'll say on that. I can't tell you as somebody who writes about race how many times I've been told we should get over slavery because white people fought in the Civil War to free us. As if, what do they think black folks were doing during that time? The idea for the Emancipation Proclamation comes from black people who are running away 
from their forced labor camps and presenting themselves as union troops. And then they're like, oh, this is property. We can treat them as contraband. Actually, we can use this uh, because the war allows you to confiscate property. We're going to treat black people as contraband, but that's because black people are self-liberating and begging, let us fight in this war to free ourselves, and we'll help the save the little union too, but mostly we just want to fight ourselves, fight for ourselves. 200,000 black men served in the Civil War, countless black women, including Harriet Tubman, who was a Civil War spy. At some point, 78% of the free black eligible uh, man population in the North fought in the Civil War. 78% of the eligible population of free black men in the North fought in the Civil War. You can't find that number amongst white Americans. And yet, how many of you have ever been taught any of that? Right? As, as Du Bois said, we don't want to learn this history because we are ashamed that black people have to save the Union and bring democracy to this country at the same time. So instead, we bury that history and we contest that history because we can't grapple with the hypocrisy of the country uh, that we were built upon. And that black America is not that we're magical, but me. Um, <laughs> right? But we are on the bottom. We were people who had nothing, we, we could think of nothing else but what freedom looked like because we had none of it. So freedom could never be these abstract ideas when you were literally enslaved. And you understand that if anybody above you, when you're on the bottom, if anybody above you loses their rights, you automatically lose yours. So black people, ideas of freedom always had to be expansive. They always had to include everyone else. So when we think about these amendments, they're not just about black people. They're about all Americans. When we think about uh, the civil rights movement, every one of those laws, they don't say you just can't discriminate against black people. You can't discriminate against people based on their race, their religion, their nat national origin, or their gender, because we have had to have an expansive view of real freedom, not abstract freedom. And yet we never get the credit for any of that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's part of the, the community of free blacks who are debating and defining equality and what they want the country to look like. The second piece is today is the 112th anniversary of the birth of Pauli Murray. Mm -hmm. How many people in this room even know who Pauli Murray is? <laughs> well, for the rest of you, we're about to have a history lesson, right? <laughs> Pauli Murray. Born in Durham, North Carolina, to a grandfather who was one of that seventy-eight percent. He was a Civil War vet. Pauli Murray does fantastic and fantastical things throughout her life, but one of the most important things is in 1941, she is in the incoming class of the Howard University School of Law. By the time she graduates, 1944. Only one of the graduate her class may graduates at the top of her class. The convention was that if you graduated number one in the class, you went to Harvard Law School to get a master's in law, and then you came back to the faculty. 1944, Harvard does admit women. So, Murray battled. <laughs> and called it her first battle against what she called Jane Crow. Jane Crow is a way to talk about how the intersection of race and sex discrimination impact individuals. What does it sound like, people? We call it intersectionality now. It's 1944. Fast forward, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is on the Supreme Court having Use Pauline Murray's intellectual work because 
all of the litigation that is advanced by the ACLU uh, Women's Project, Women's Rights Project, is based on a theory about equality that Murray worked out as a Howard Law student in a seminar paper for a class. Murray contributed to what won Brown versus Board of Education, as well as what opened up the protection clause to include women in terms of the groups to which constitutional equality is guaranteed. Today's her birthday, right? So. The only point here is this is part of the truth telling, right? This is part of us lifting up our own narrative, truth be told. And the beauty of being able to do it in a place like Howard is that it, we're lifting it up for our sake, right? It's not about satisfying the white gaze, right? Because much of what we do with Howard truth day to day, with all due respect, right? The white gaze really doesn't figure into it. We're here trying to figure out, I often joke with my students, how are we going to be free, right? What does black joy and freedom look like in the context of this country that we are continually attempting to not just challenge but make of, make it a better place than what it can even imagine because its imagination is limited by the white nationalism, right, and the exclusive nature of rights rather than the expansive and universal nature. So I did want to take the opportunity to say, to do a little Howard shout out, right? <laughs> because, you know, even before we were Howard, we were at the table, right? And we were at the table helping to figure out what we wanted for us, largely, clearly having to deal with the larger context in which we're dealing, but recognizing that what we viewed as important was largely disconnected from what the framers and the founders and those who were governing at the time considered to be important. Mm -hmm. Polly Murray also, and here is where civil rights law is created, right, as a field. And Polly Murray was a primary architect of uh, civil rights law. So just thought I'd add that in the next day. <laughs> She's like, I'm still here. No, no, I, I am completely grateful to be listening to this. So I am completely fine. Since uh, we have talked about the hypocrisy of what America tries to say democracy is, um, apart from being very cognizant of our history, what do you both think? would need to be done in order to, I guess, eliminate that vision of a true democracy in our country? How would we put that into practice? Uh, how would we put democracy into practice? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Is this being recorded? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I'm not about to be on Fox News tonight. <laughs> you know, that's that's a big question because on the one hand, I I do think, you know, we were founded as a white supremacist, settler colonialist nation. That is who we are. That, you know, this is what the 690 Project argues is uh, slavery is one of the oldest institutions in what will become the United States. It is foundational to our legal, political, cultural, and social systems. And this anti-democratic uh, tendency, therefore, also embedded in our society. So to have democracy, one voting has to be easy. Mm -hmm. 
voting has to be fair, right? So gerrymandering is anti-democratic. The Electoral College is anti-democratic. All of these ways to try to ensure that the will of the people cannot actually be realized are all anti-democratic. So we would need massive reforms of just basic things like voting, but that doesn't even get to you know the racial wealth gap that uh, was created through 350 years of slavery and racial apartheid, which means that even if we have equal rights in our society, we can't exercise them equally because black people have too little wealth um, to do that. Um, we have to end things like felon disenfranchisement laws, right? That in some places, for instance, Tennessee, one fifth of the black population cannot vote because they have a felony conviction. Uh, all of these laws get passed after 1965 because what you learn about America is the old systems never go away, they adapt. So you can't have complete slavery anymore, so you have a Jim Crow. Right, you can't have complete disenfranchisement anymore. So you find ways just to peel off enough black voters uh, to make a difference. Um, you know, things like prison labor, which is allowed by the 13th Amendment. There's just, there's so much that would have to be structured in our society. And I think what we, we think, we tend to believe that because our country is becoming less white, not majority minority, which is a term everybody likes to use, which is an oxymoron, because majority and minority are in their terms. You can't be both more than half and less than half. So what they really mean is a country led by inferiors, right? People who are less than. That is how we're really talking about minority. Um, but we know what minority rule looks like in America. So there's nothing to make us believe that once our country becomes less white, that we will have more democracy. What actually history would tell us is that once our country becomes less white, we will have less democracy. Because what we're seeing now, efforts to subvert elections, uh, efforts to, to gerrymander, you know, Florida, all the news reports were giving DeSantis all these props for how he turned Florida. He gerrymandered Florida. Florida could not possibly have gotten a different result because Democratic votes in Florida don't count as much as Republican votes because of gerrymandering. So all of those things show us that what we're seeing in terms of this hyperpolarization has everything to do with the demographics of our country. So how you know how do we um, how do we become a real democracy in a country that was never founded to be one? I don't know, and I don't know that we will. What I do know is that black folks will keep fighting because we don't have a choice. <laughs> The only thing I would add would be we can't leave out the least democratic branch of the government. Supreme Court. And that would be the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in particular. Yes. Uh, because as we saw, go back to Reconstruction. Congress is functional. It enacts the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It enacts the Civil Rights Act of 1875. It uses what if used for something else, would be deemed its plenary power based on the constitutional party that has been given to legislate this way. Civil Rights Act of 1875 is stopped dead in its tracks by the, by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court concluding that Congress has in fact legislated in an unconstitutional way beyond the scope of the authority that the document gave them. Oh, I'm sorry, as interpreted by the court. Mm -hmm. Right. So that shows us what they did and may foreshadow what we're about to see with the six three majority that the court has now. So, you know, we saw it with Dobbs, although it was still essentially kind of, you know, because, and then we got the Supreme Court justice. But I don't know if any of you all listened at all to the oral arguments around for the uh, UNC and affirmative action, affirmative action cases, but uh, it's 
nice that we have Supreme Court justices who understand the same history. It was a history lesson mm -hmm. uh, appealing to those who claim to be originals to say, well, if we're talking about the 14th Amendment, then the originalists actually intended it to be race conscious. Yes. The originalists intended it to be an affirmative base for Congress to look at legislate. And what stopped that was, I don't know, the English justice, us in a different version, a different configuration of us. Yeah. But that the way it's set up, the least democratic branch of the government has the ability to ensure that any potential for democracy with respect to the other two can be absolutely thwarted. That's how Congress worked, right? Congress hasn't really worked for a while now. So with Congress not working, the executive branch, whatever, right? That means, oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but then that means that we're looking at the court and the teams of personnel on the court at this point. They're telling you what's coming. And what's coming is even more or even less democratic uh, than what we've seen before. Absolutely. And I think what's important, so we are all taught, of course, that America is exceptional, right? This is an exceptional nation. So what I have found to be useful is to study the way that we actually are exceptional. So, for instance, um, if you look at other Western democracies, we're the only one that have three kilo points, right? Mm -hmm. Where the president can veto, Congress can overrule the president, and the Supreme Court can veto everyone. That actually is not how most democracies work. That you don't have these three different areas that can basically create gridlock, which is what our politics have. Um, when you think about uh, the fact that our polarization is also linked to black and other people of color now having the ability to determine elections. Mm -hmm. So we didn't see this type, I mean, clearly there was polarization, we had a civil war, right? But after the civil war, when everyone in Congress were white men, some had different political views, so they didn't agree on politics, but they agreed on the, the legitimacy of the other party to rule. So there's a difference between saying, I don't like your politics, and saying, actually, if people vote for you, it is illegitimate. We don't actually believe that you can legitimately rule our country, and that your voters are legitimate voters. That begins after 1965, when people of color, and significantly black people, start determining elections, right? You have a pretty equal balance between white voters, then 10%, a 10 to 12% voting block that's voting one way or another determines elections. That's the understanding of Black people works. That's when you start to see this really high polarization and this belief that one political party is simply not legitimate because there are too many non legitimate voters, voters of color uh, in that group. So it is useful to think about the ways we're exceptional, right? We're exceptional in that we are the, um, we have the highest poverty rates of the Western democracies. We have the most inequality of the Western democracies. We have the lowest life expectancy of the Western democracies. We're the only one of the Western democracies where whether you can go to the doctor or not depends on if you have a job that offers you health care. That's not just hurting black folks. It hurts us disproportionately. But there are millions of white people who get sick and suffer because they don't have health care either because what the data shows, what the polling shows, is that white Americans stop supporting social programs and they think too many black people are benefiting from. Yeah. Right? So we hurt ourselves in a like a so-called democratic society because we can't get over our race. And that is truly what makes us exceptional. Because the difference between us and the European power that all engaged in slavery, clearly, right? All of the European, not all, most of the European countries may engage in slavery, but they didn't engage in slavery on their land. So once slavery ends, they don't have to deal with the population of the people they enslaved. So they don't pass policy around that. But in the United States, we enslave people right here and at emancipation. Those people are the largest racial group in our country. And so every time we pass policy, we're thinking about this group that we wish wasn't here. 
and that we think are undeserving of being here, and that we're never supposed to be here and receive the bounty of America. So that makes us a very stingy society unnecessarily, and it also makes our democracy extremely fragile. I'm going to clap for that cry. <laughs> Patriotism looks like. And I don't think patriotism is performative. 
I don't think patriotism is my country can do no wrong. I don't think patriotism is wearing a flag pin or flying an American flag. I think patriotism, if patriotism is a worthy cause, which I don't know that it is, um, I think a lot of terrible things have been done in the name of nation and in the name of patriotism. And here in the United States, a lot of terrible things have been done to people of color, both here and uh, abroad in the name of that. But um, I also think no one has the right to take away our lineage in this country as black people and our legacy as black people. And so in researching for democracy, both trying to understand our collective identity as black Americans um, who are here not because we wanted to be, but were forced to be, um, and trying to understand my father, um, how a black man born in apartheid Mississippi could be patriotic. Um, I came to understand both him and the black folks, like Frederick Douglass, who said, you're not going to put us out of our own country. Our ancestors' blood is in the soil. We have fought in every war that this country has had. Our bones are here. We built this country, not just with our bodies, but with our intellect. Um, and why should we be a people without a nation? Which is basically what we have to be, right? If we don't have a flag we can claim. We don't want to, we can't feel that, you know, a sense of nationalism for our country because we're black. So then what, what, what are we? So all that to say is, I, I don't know. I imagine I'll always be conflicted about these ideas. But what I do think is, if I am patriotic, if black people are to be patriotic, it is the patriotism that says, I will relentlessly critique my country. I will relentlessly fight my own country. Because I do believe right, that our country can be better, it should be better, and that those ideals laid out in that declaration, not in the Constitution, that's the thing, you don't even quote the Constitution, right? These ideals in the declaration, which a black man, by the way, um, if you read Woody Holmes' book, Liberty is Sweet, he, he talks about how it was a black man who took those opening words of the declaration and said, this is a declaration of liberty for all people. And white people didn't see it as a liberty document. Black people are the ones who trained us all to see this as a liberty document. That if we understand this is the only country we will ever have and ever know, this country would not exist like it exists without us. This country would not be a democracy without us. Um, we would not have the freedoms that we have without black people. Uh, we would not have the culture, right? The music, the literature, the fashion, all the things we export to the world. Um, as you talk about Pauli Murray, the intellectual contributions that black people have made to this country. So, Yes, I, I believe in a patriotism that says we will fight our country to force it to live up to its highest ideals. And if that's how we define patriotism, then I'm still patriotic as Jason. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, and I said, I just I think nationalism is just generally not a good thing, no matter who it is. So it's hard for me, it will always be hard for me to plan any sort of patriotism uh, because just as a black person who descends from slavery um, and just see how harmful nationalism has been to so many people in the world. Why do we want that? Like, a nation, nations are good and nations are bad at the same time. Every nation does terrible things and good things at the same time. Um, and so I, I find that most useful. But I also think we, as a people, deserve um, to be able to claim the country we build. You know? Agree with that. And thank you so much for that insightful perspective. Um, Mr. Angels, you were just mentioning about like all the contributions that black people have made to this country and how we have not any barely any recognition for it. Uh, with that being said, I want to know whether or not uh, there are more stories about the cult of the black people's cultivation um, to democracy that you didn't really get to shed light on in the chapter. I just want to make sure that um, that can be expressed in this setting today. There's a million stories. I know there's a million stories. Really I mean, on yeah, I, it's just this essay was 10,000 words, and yet I still felt like I could barely touch the surface. Uh, 
I wanted to quote, in my original draft, I quoted Martin Delaney at length when he argued for the universal rights of, of men and women. Um, I, I quoted the Colored Citizens Conventions at length as they're putting forth these, these ideals. I was quoting Ida B. Wells. I mean, there's just, there's so much. Um, and that's not, that's just America, right? And then you go out into the broader Atlantic world where black people are also shaping ideas of freedom, where black people are resisting, where black people are fighting. Um, I, I recently went uh, on a podcast in Brazil. These Brazilian journalists created their own version of the 1619 Project to unearth uh, the way that slavery has shaped that society. When I think of a, a, another society in our hemisphere that most closely relates to the United States, it is Brazil, you can have their own tropical trunk, uh, was, <laughs> was defeated, right? So, um, and they did what has become the most popular podcast in the country. Um, it's called Project Parano, and it's um, made after the, the, his, the father of Black Brazilian history. And so you see these same, all these parallels of like black people exerting their will. Um, and yet we're not taught to think about that, right? We really think about um, the, see, I was going on on a tangent, that's what I do. But <laughs> when, when you think about um, how we're taught about the English being the ones who end the transatlantic slave trade. And as, as uh, Eric Williams said, it's almost as if the English started slavery just so they could get credit for ending, right? <laughs> Like that's the way that we're taught. Like we're supposed to like give you debts because after profiting off of the transatlantic slave trade for 250 years, you're like, okay, it's not so profitable for us anymore. Um, but part of the reason that they want to end their involvement in transatlantic slave trade is because of all of the rebellions that they're facing in the English colonies. And it's becoming too difficult to maintain slavery. It's not worth it to them financially at some point. Um, but we don't get credit for that, right? We don't get credit for the idea of the abolition, right? The abolitionists we learned about are all white. Like, like the main people fighting against slavery would not be the people who are enslaved. Um, so all of that, I think, is like why um, when we think about these broader concepts of who we are as America, who we are as part of this, this global uh, diaspora of black people, um, it's just critical to connect all of these dots together. So I, don't, what, I don't even remember what your question was. <laughs> I don't know if I'm so far. Oh, you asked what, what story? Okay, a million. There's a million stories. But I will say that the, um, not for democracy specifically, but two of the other essays that will be part of the read, the read of all um, that I think really expand our understanding of our country is one is dispossession which deals with settler colonialism um, and how you can't have free labor if you don't first have stolen lands, right? You can't expand slavery until you've taken the land to expand the slavery on, but then also that part of the uh, civilization process for the south, south uh, eastern tribes is engaged in chattel slavery. So uh, how they hope to show white people that they can be civilized is they enslave African people, including in my, in my dad's hometown. Um, and the other one is fear, which really talks about how the Haitian Revolution, which the Haitian Revolution happens right here in our hemisphere, yet we only learn about the French one. There's a reason for that, right? There's always a reason for what we're taught and what we're not taught. Um, but it talks about, you know, the first country to abolish slavery is Haiti. It's not America. America's not first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth. America is nearly last to abolish slavery. And so you have this free black republic that abolishes slavery in a sea of slave colonies, which we have punished ever since for daring, having the audacity to free themselves, and they have to pay reparations to the people who enslaved them. That if you understand that the Haitian Revolution stoked such fear in the white colonists, in the, in the early white Americans, that they could successfully overthrow not just the French, they fought the Spanish, right? Three colonial powers, the English, the Spanish, and the French. What will our enslaved people do here? And so, as the Haitians are ending slavery, we are expanding slavery. The Louisiana Purchase, we all learn about, we get that because the Haitians, they bankrupt Napoleon. 
And he has to offload this land. But we're not taught about that when we're taught about the, the Louisiana Purchase. So them getting their freedom expands slavery for Black Americans and leads to a, a greater restriction of our rights. So I say that to say, you can study this history your whole life and never learn even this much of what can be known. But every new fact you learn uh, begins to chip away at this false history, this false narrative of our country and of Black people uh, across the world. I mean, I think you, you cannot overemphasize the threat that Haiti was viewed as constituted and how it shaped how Black people, enslaved and free, were then policed. Yes. <clears throat> really. Um, Martha Jones includes, I want to say it's in her phrases, uh, a story about, I want to say it's a free black man who is, uh, he's a sailor, he's working on ship. And coming into the port of Charleston, there were rules that prevented those black folks who were working on those ships from disembarking yes. in uh, Charleston for fear that the news that they would carry would include news of what was going on in Haiti. Um, but yeah, absolutely scary. And then she, similar things after Nat Turner, right? In the Nat Turner uh, uprising. Um, and these uprisings are being inspired by the Haitian Revolution. Absolutely. And Virginia right. then outlaws literacy, yeah. in part because Nat Turner was literate. Yes. Um, um, I, absolutely. <laughs> which is down, I believe, at the uh, Museum of African American uh, History and Culture. It's in the uh, Smithsonian uh, collection. I think it ended up there. Um, but that's where you're looking in the silences, right? You're looking in, in the in-between spaces to begin to understand that the other part of growing up in the United States is we are taught a history that only occasionally goes beyond our own board, right? Much of this excavation requires us to put together the dots, and oftentimes it begins with a chronology, and you sort of lay it out and say, oh, you know what? I didn't realize that these things happen so closely together. Maybe there's something here. Maybe there's a connection. That's when you begin to dig and dig and dig, and then you find out all the other exactly thing. Yes. But that's not the stuff that we tend to be taught in school, and definitely not in public school, but in private school, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Thank you guys, thank you so much for that. I think um, it's a time for the question. Yes, okay. it's now time for the Q&A portion of um, the event. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, thank you so much for being here. Um, we, you all talked briefly about the Supreme Court. This conversation has been a lot about, of course, black people and race. As we only did a game a lot in the policy, as we see the court march towards this color blindness idea, how do we grapple with that in democracy and kind of thinking of where we're going as a people and a country? Thank you. Um, I think um, color blindness. Um, grappling with it, I think, first requires that we really understand where it came from. And this notion of color blindness surfaces in the dissenting opinions written by the 
Is it the second justice on Yeah. Um, in reaction to bad majority opinions in Plessy versus Ferguson and the civil rights cases. So he's having a conversation with the other justices and what ends up happening, the, the false notion of color blindness, I think, is demonstrated by the first case that the court decided post the 14th Amendment and that would, or the one to interpret the 14th Amendment, that would be the slaughterhouse cases. In that case, the majority opinion says this is intended to protect black people. So they start off with an absolutely race conscious, racially specific reading of 13 and 14. By the time you get to the end of Reconstruction, getting ready for the redemption period, you've got a majority of the court that seems to have forgotten that it decided to slaughter us, but you've got Harlan in dissent saying ours is a constitution that is colorblind, it doesn't recognize um, any, I want to say, class or caste difference, blah, 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 right? Fast forward past Brown to Baki. Right, which is the, I believe, the first case that actually makes it to the Supreme Court on the merits to challenge affirmative action in the UC system, specifically at UC Davis's med school. Their program was deemed to be a quota and unconstitutional, but right around the time of Baki, you begin to hear more and more of this rhetoric about colorblindness. It's hard to remedy a race-based injury with a colorblind solution, <laughs> right? So at the time when we're right on the cusp of, it looks like we're, we're gonna start seeing things that are intended to be remedial, but remedial with respect to the, the foundational sort of injury um, that is allowed to exist because Plessy comes up as bad law until it's overturned, uh, at, at least with respect to K through 12 education in, um, in Brown. But at the time when desegregation becomes what is mandated by the court, we begin to hear about colorblindness, which then allows desegregation to be distinguished from integration. So the 14th Amendment, for example, is read as not mandating integration, but rather mandating desegregation. And then we get to diversity, right? And that's right now the, you know, the buzzword. We're concerned about diversity, diversity, but I'm not necessarily that excited about that version of diversity given the trajectory, you know, that got us there. Because diversity is very different from desegregation. Right, and a continuing, there is nothing in the Constitution that requires a continuing commitment to maintaining desegregation. Right, so once, it's almost as if you go through life, you hit a point, you were segregated, then you hit the point of desegregation, and as far as the law is concerned, then you're off the hook. You don't have to do anything else, and if you try to use race to continue, your own view of, let's say, integration, that use of race then becomes unconstitutional based on this notion of colorblindness, which is taken out of context, out of a dissenting opinion in a case from long ago. So I don't really, I hope I answered your question. Um, 
I did. Yes. Oh, good. Oh. Can I add a more lay person? Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs>
that to me, when we're, when we're talking about the idea of colorblindness, no black person that I know wants you to look at us and not see who we are. What they do want is you not to look at us and then take things from us or prevent us from doing things because of our lineage going back to slavery, which is the only reason that we have a category called black in the first place is because of slavery. So that to me, I think, is really important as we're thinking about this language of colorblindness, the harms of colorblindness, because just to give a, 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 I think, a tangible example, red line, right, which is created by the federal government. So any city in America, if you want to, if you go to the black community, that black community was created through federal redlining policies. You can look at the redlining maps, overlay those redlining maps. Y'all know what redlining is? Right, this is when the federal government determined which area it would ensure federal housing loans in, or housing loans in, and it redlined black neighborhoods and said these neighborhoods were too risky, so they were uninsurable. So this creates all of the disinvestment in black neighborhoods. It, it creates a dual housing system where property values are determined by race. Because if you can't get loans in black neighborhoods, the property values go down, right? So in 1968, redlining becomes illegal. But no one reset the housing values, right? No one changed the housing values to now make black housing values equal to white housing values. No one came with all this money and gave black people loans in the community that for the first 50 years of that program received no loans whatsoever, right? None of that happened. All they said was, from now on, we can't do this anymore. Our bad. That doesn't change anything. Because what we know, and this is what critical race theory teaches, is that once the inequality becomes structured in society, it is self-replicated. You don't have to be racist. It just, it continues on its own without anyone having to take those steps. And so what affirmative policies were saying is, you created that segregation through official policy. So you have to undo it through official policy. And that policy cannot be race blind if what created it was race specific. And the court until the Nixon administration, which is a similar uh, period, right? Nixon appoints all of these judges and they get a 5 4 conservative majority. The court under um, the Brown court, Warren, the Warren court was saying it's not enough to say segregation can no longer continue. School districts have to affirmatively integrate. If that means counting people, if that means moving black kids to a white school, white kids to a black school, that's what you have to do. The court says it may be perverse, but some perversity is required to undo a system of racial apartheid that was architected through law policy. And now we want to say that that is bad. And it's easy for people with power to say that that is bad because that, they already know that unless you take affirmative steps, nothing will change. And they will continue to have better access to resources, better access to wealth, better property values, everything that was created under these systems. So we can't embrace a colorblind ideology until we have purged right, race as a real thing that deprives black people of material resources from our society and we haven't done it. Sorry, that was a whole, sorry. That was a whole. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to have no more time for no more questions. We got one question. Just in the depth. <laughs> And that would be that an additional limitation is, at least from when the court decided a uh, case out of Richmond called the Curlson case, the court made it very clear, we're not interested in societal discrimination, we're not interested in systemic anything, we're not interested in institutional, and that's not proof of anything. What you have to bring to the table is you have to bring me the person or institution that treated an identifiable person, hopefully you, in a racially discriminatory way, as a result of that discrimination, you've been harmed. It's really hard, right, then to get to anything more than individual instances, potentially, of discrimination when the court has cut you off from, because basically you're saying, well, I'm on your own yet. Beside the point, it's irrelevant. We're not here to fix what's wrong with society. We're not here to fix what's happening socially or institutionally, and Lord knows we're not interested in anything that you're gonna claim is systemic. Right? We need an individual wrongdoer who we can say is culpable and responsible for whatever 
injury, your identified individual injured person has in fact suffered and that we can deal with. All the rest of that stuff you all are talking about, mm -mm, we're, we're, not, we're not here for it. And the more you talk about institutional and systemic stuff in this climate, means that those who have twisted patriotism to suit their own needs and are actually acting in a way to close things down rather than to open things up, those people then point to you and say that you're part of a problem, you're telling lies, you're fomenting division, you're trying to bring everything down in a flaming hot keep a mess, right? And that's a hard... Is that a, is that, was that legal term? That is. <laughs> <laughs> that's a legal term. Right. Yes. Um, so it, it's even more difficult, right? Because there are fewer smoking guns, right? Of course, right? It's illegal. So most people know. Today. Most people know not to say, I'm not giving you that loan because you're black, right? But it's going to be about your neighborhood, right? Which is race neutral yeah. and a reasonable basis for them to make whatever decision they're going to make about where you live without actually dealing with the, the structural piece of why it is that you may in fact live where it is that you live. And that they're still just discriminating, right? I mean, this this is this is the, the benefit, right? The benefit of what conservatives have managed to do, and frankly, not just conservatives, mm -hmm. um, is again take the, the ideology of the civil rights movement and not deploy it against equality. So the real racists are people who pay attention to race, right? The real racists are people who talk about race. The real racists are people who say we have inequality and you have to pay attention to race and undo it. The very fact that we are noticing or talking about it, we are the racists. And the fact that they can pretend that race, no, racism no longer exists except a few bad apples means that they are like, you know, the true uh, beneficiary of Martin Luther King's dream, yeah. where they only quote that one, one word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right, so all of these, you know, people, or even our own activists, are deployed against us to maintain uh, racial hierarchy. They're like, we cut it off. Two more? Two more. That's great. I want to get back and run We're going to do the scene right now. We are. Hi, thank you all so much um, for this real long day conversation. Um, my name is Jasmine, and uh, I sit at the intersection of the end of the millennial generation and the start of Generation Z. And um, you gotta give me some years. I don't have no idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in the later 90s, so okay. I'm in my mid 20s. Um, and um, just studying kind of the identities um, that have been formed in the millennial generation and that are forming within Generation Z, um, especially when it comes to social issues, especially when it comes to the identity of black folks at large within this land, within this so called democracy. And when you all um, discussed, um, when she asked about the uh, kind of what I interpret as the ideal vision of uh, democracy for you all, um, and there was a backlog of talking about this land being built all walking around, um, and several institutions from slavery um, to the now prison industrial complex that um, a lot of folks are working to abolish and abolish. Uh, the idea of abolishment often is stopped at one end to end something but doesn't have the capacity a lot of times in our history to go to the idea of um, imagining things and creating things um, from what has been destructed. And so my question, in short, is um, how do we begin to construct using Robin Kelly's freedom dream um, idea, ideology, how do we begin to construct, I think that a lot of us know as um, persons who are in a younger generation, um, but and are utilizing boys, but where do we begin with small steps of working to get to the so-called mansion of actualizing a democracy for us by us? Uh, 
I mean, I'll be, I'll be quick. So uh, <laughs> this country will never be for us to buy us. So I also believe we just be realistic about uh, what we're facing. We are 13% minority in a country that is slaying our ancestors. Um, and then the other part that I'll say is, <laughs> I'm hoping you'll be more hopeful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason I became a journalist and not an activist uh, or organizer is I just get to write about all the problems and then y'all have to figure out how to fix it. And then he's like, you know, we're different. 
Mm -hmm. That's in the past. You know, you went to elementary school in like the mid, well, no, not mid, late 60s. Things are different now. It's all about race for you all. Trust and believe. That is not the same response at this point. And in some ways, you all have had to do a little bit of living that made you have to step out of the very comfortable cocoon that we as your parents actually created for you based on our desire that you not have to go through what we went through. Right, but it created this false sense of, at least when you were younger, right, that we were the ones who kept dragging up the race thing and it was all over and done with. But now you all are having a different experience. So I would encourage you and your compatriots to be as expansive as possible, but really spend time thinking about what the world you want to inhabit looks like in an affirmative way rather than as a reaction to the things you don't like. Um, the entire Constitution, 
That's where we start. We start with the text. And then from there, we, we do the, the case method, whatever, whatever. We do the legal thing. But I believe that the freedom that I'm given at this particular institution to teach the, to teach the Constitution that exists, not the expurgated version that takes out the three-fifths clause or gets rid of uh, 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 clauses about fugitivity and all the rest of that. No, 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 no. We're reading the whole thing. And my hope is that by virtue of that practice, what I have been able to do as I approach retirement is plant seeds that will multiply exponentially beyond what I could have done as an individual advocate attempting to do what it is that I love training other people to do. I mean, I've only been a professor for two semesters, so I don't have, I don't have a lot to say. Uh, but by nature, our profession is one of skepticism. Uh, the the adage that you learn in uh, you know news writing one hundred and one is if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> um, we are as a field supposed to be skeptical of power, skeptical of narratives, to not trust what people are telling us, to find out and verify for ourselves. So the, I teach the sixteen nineteen project, and every day my that I have class, my students come in just shocked by what they have not been taught. Right, in a way, and I'm like, okay, so you should be skeptical then of everything, right? Not just this history, but all of the things. The first thing we do on day one is that I assign you a piece about the slave Bible. Mm. So, where black people were able to uh, read and write, they often had a separate Bible. The slave Bible removes passages like Exodus, right? Passages that will lead black folks to read the Bible and say, oh, I need to be free. <laughs> God does not condone my slavery. And instead, they receive the Bible that said, the slave will be your master. And so we start with that because what I'm saying is you only getting part of the story. You have to go to the source and read the whole thing, not what somebody has decided to give you or tell you. So we begin the course in that way. Um, how I will be successful with my students that they are constantly questioning, constantly being curious, not just accepting anything, not just what we're learning about our history, but what are they consuming in the news, what, what just in general. Um, to me, that's the highest calling of an education, no matter what you're teaching. That's why I have um, you know, all the book bans, all the critical race theory propaganda, uh, because if your education is merely confirming your life view, your education has failed you. And education should make you uncomfortable. It should expose you to things that you had never thought about. Uh, it should lead you to question that that's the highest calling of any education to me. And I hope that my students come away from my classroom having felt uh, as I did in Mr. Ray Dow's class when I was 15 years old, uh, that there was this whole world of knowledge and I had got a little crack in the door that it existed. And I wanted to find out as much about it as I could. So I hope that's what my class does. Uh, that was all the time we have for all the questions. Once again, thank you, Professor Hannah Jones and Professor Ruth Robinson, for joining us today and having this conversation. And thank you all who made a person in those of you to be on the live stream for joining us in this powerful dialogue. It's been such a pleasure to moderate this discussion. And those of you who want to tune into the 1619 Project Read Along, you can visit 1619books.com to visit that. And I believe the next chapter that we read is chapter six, which is capitalism. Before we end, can we just show yes. some appreciation for Cindy? It is not easy. Thank <laughs> you.